I invite Dr. Rajiv Menon to give his talk on acute MI interventions. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I was given the topic uh, to discuss about uh, some of the complications which I landed into and came out of in acute MI. I think uh, the ball has been set rolling by uh, discussing about a fight in the mud, but uh, when you actually go in to intervene in an acute MI situation, you really don't know whether you are going to land up on the mat or you are going to land up in the mud. And uh, some of uh, the cases which I will be showing you today will have a part of both probably. Somewhere we did an excellent job and somewhere we, uh, uh, for some unknown reason, we landed into one trouble uh, after the other. So I will be just presenting to you about three cases. Uh, this was uh, the first patient. He was around uh, 40 year old. He came with an inferior wall MI. This was around 11, 11.30 in the morning. And then uh, it was a routine practice, so we just took him to the cat lab, cat him, and it was uh, LCX uh, total occlusion. And all of us thought, uh, okay, fine, this should be uh, just a routine uh, type of uh, angioplasty, went ahead with the wire. And after the thrombosuction was done, uh, you can see here that uh, amazingly the whole LMCA got uh, dissected. So that was uh, something which was uh, really surprising. I will just come back to it and discuss with you what actually might have uh, cause that. You can see here, you can notice here very clearly that the LMCA there had got uh, dissected and it was extending into the ostium of the LAD. Uh, so the first thing uh, there was to make sure that we did a proper job and make sure that the patient goes back home safely. Uh, so we went ahead with the stinting of the circumflex first. We first wired the LAD to make sure that we have access to the LAD. Went ahead, stented the LCX and then put a stent from LMCA into the LAD and the end result was uh, quite good. I'll just come to the end result. Now, uh, what actually happened was uh, when we pushed in the wire and then uh, did the thrombosuction, uh, one precaution which we need to take is the gas or the reused thrombosuction catheters, especially the thrombuster or the export catheters. Their trackability is not as good as a new catheter. And when you are actually trying to push, as you can see, there is acute angle between the LMC and LCX. As you are trying to push, sometimes the lumen goes and gets stuck in the wire and that causes the kinking of the wire. This wire actually probably got looped here and as there was some pressure which was put to push in the thrombuster catheter into the circumflex, this wire actually caused that dissection. So this was an ugly dissection, absolutely uh, straightforward inferior wall MI and you can see that uh, we landed up with a LMCA stent. Uh, luckily uh, for us, uh, this was the final result and uh, we did a check angio about a year later and the patient is doing uh, quite well and in spite of us he's been doing quite okay. The next case which I'll be showing you, uh, probably I'll leave the decision on you whether the operator was more unlucky or the patient was more unlucky to have that operator. Uh, this lady was a 65 year old lady. Uh, she, uh, she actually came with acute anterior wall MI. This was around uh, 12 o'clock in the night. And then we took her to the cath lab. Uh, she had a LAD total occlusion. We opened it up. It was supposed to be, again, a straightforward primary angioplasty. Uh, we just uh, went ahead with the uh, stenting of the LAD. But uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately for her, uh, the LAD had a distal dissection. So this is the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you can uh, see her, this was the LAD stent and that was the distal dissection. So we just took a 2.5, uh, 12 mm stent and uh, I think it was 2.75 into 12 and we thought we'll just seal the dissection. So the first problem which we faced was that we dissected the distal end of the stent. Now, once we started inflating the stent, Unfortunately for us, there was a balloon rupture. And uh, this was at around uh, two to three atmospheres. The moment the, star the balloon started inflating, you can see that the contrast has gone down. This, again, is an important point for somebody who is uh, in, uh, uh, doing uh, these type of interventions, that always keep a watch on how the balloon is inflating. The first clue that there is a dye which is going distally, it indicates that the balloon has ruptured there. Now, this was at around three atmospheres, and naturally at 12 o'clock in the night when you're alone with a junior staff, that uh, presses some kind of panic buttons. So uh, what uh, we did initially was uh, immediately try to inflate as much as possible, because 
uh, we knew that we are going to land into a situation here. Now, once this was done, it was evident that it was an underdeployed stand, and the next thing which we should have done is probably get back the balloon and push the balloon over the same wire. The one thing which you should never do in these situations is take out the wire. Please mark it. One thing you should never do in this situation is remove the wire. And that is exactly what we did. So if you see here, for some unknown reason, we thought that with the balloon, the stent had come back. And the whole system, along with the wire, we took it out. With the wrong uh, presumption that probably the stent has come along with the balloon into the guide catheter. Probably uh, there was some difficulty in seeing the fluoro or the sinew properly that made us believe that the stent has come along with the balloon into the guide catheter. So we didn't want to embolize it, and uh, we took out the guide along with the wire. Uh, the whole system was brought out, and once we removed that, then you can clearly see that there was a free stent there floating in the previous pass, pass. So because that's the stent that there. A free floating there. stent was left so possible, into the stent which we had already deployed previously. So now you had a stent which had a distal dissection, and now you had a free floating so stent within that particular and stent. And with that we so went ahead with the first uh, then uh, the we went, went ahead with the procedure. The there was no other option. No, once, uh, we decided went, that we just try to pass because we were confident that it was partially inflated. So if possible, probably we will try to cross the wire into the stent. The if it's not possible, probably uh, crush the stent against the previous stent. stent. So, now so we that was the plan, the and with that we went ahead with uh, the first wire. wire. The wire went the stent, between the two stents. Uh, now once uh, the that wire went, then that you can see that we took a whisper, a hydrophilic wire. So uh, the basic idea was to go into the second stent, and luckily for us, by a stroke of luck, the wire actually went through that particular stent. So now we were in again control of the situations. Uh, we had uh, one wire outside so the stent and another point, uh, wire which had uh, went gone time, across the previously the under deployed stent. Uh, and, uh, so the next thing was to take 1.1 mm balloon, the smallest balloon which we had at that time. And you can see that uh, with a jerky movement it went in and uh, after that we could go ahead with uh, subsequent inflation. So we inflated with 1.25 balloon I think at that time and then went ahead with a 2.5 mm balloon. Around and uh, later we just took a stent because the distal dissection was still there. We went ahead with that uh, stent deployment and then uh, that was the final result. So we had three stents there. Uh, one original stent, the other a free stent which was again inflated and then the final stent. So this uh, whole procedure I think took about an uh, hour and a half and uh, this was around this was midnight by the time we finished it was around 1.30 am. This patient uh, is doing well, this is about one and a half years since we did it. Uh, we got her back for a check angio about eight months later and luckily for us uh, there has not been any stent restenosis. Uh, the third and the final case is uh, again a similar type of uh, problem which we faced. This was again an anterior wall MI, again a run of the mill angioplasty. Kind you can see the stent being deployed it has some and uh, so when it appeared all right till now the balloon, and then suddenly you can notice that there okay. is something which has but appeared the beyond the stent. Initially we could not understand what exactly is going on but over a course of uh, time when we analyzed then we so realized that this problem occurs when the balloon has some kind of a manufacturing defect or it has some pinhole. So when you are actually inflating the balloon, initially for about 6 to 8 atmospheres it is okay. But once you cross the 10 to 12 atmosphere pressure, this produces a jet that actually tears the intima and produces this type of a subintimal hematoma. So this is a subintimal hematoma and it is extremely important for you to again realize that again the importance of continuously doing fluoroscopy when you are inflating the stent because if you keep inflating in this situation there is high probability that this hematoma will perforate through and cause a total coronary perforation. So we immediately deflated it, waited for some time and we knew that uh, you can see that uh, it is a very ugly looking subintimal hematoma. Uh, we waited for some time and then took another balloon, a new balloon of a similar size and then went to a nominal pressure and finally we could uh, seal that uh, perforation and it was an excellent result and the patient uh, did well. So I thought uh, there are a lot of uh, things which we face day in and day out in acute myocardial infarction, 
but I thought I'll just put forward to you some of the representative cases uh, where uh, we narrowly escape some catastrophic uh, results. Uh, concluding, I would say that complications are not uncommon in primary angioplasty. A high level of expertise and skill is needed to tackle the situation. Please be quick but maintain cool. If you are going to hurry up in that type of situation, you might create more trouble for the patient and yourself rather than solving the problem. Once you land into complication, just step back, take a time out, wait for about 10 to 15 seconds or 30 seconds, think what you want to do next and then proceed with it. And that always primary don't primary feel bad to ask help of colleagues and surgeons. Surgeons are not your enemies. If you feel that this situation is unsalvageable, at least call the surgeons. They will help you in many a situation. And always keep the patient's interest foremost. It's not important what you present in a conference in the end, but it's the patient going back comfortable and safe, which is more important. And finally, in primary PCI, we say kiss and be happy. This is keep it simple and actually it's keep it simple and safe and be happy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for an excellent presentation of three cases.